You may be seated. So I didn't write my sermon down this week because guess who we're commemorating today? Martin Luther. So if I didn't know what to say about Martin Luther, I don't know if I should be up here. <laughs> so how many of you know the story of Martin Luther? <laughs> well, I think you're talking about Martin Luther King. I think it's a little different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> How many of you actually have heard the story of Martin Luther? Now, was it the PG version or the R-rated version? <laughs> Martin Luther was pretty R-rated. I was actually thinking of just printing off a bunch of the sick burns that he had towards the Pope. But then I was like, mm, that's probably not gospel-centered. So I didn't do that. But if you want a fun time Googling, just Google Martin Luther attacks the Pope, and <laughs> you will be shocked on the things that he said about the Pope. Uh, but I love this little series, a very short introduction. It's uh, Oxford Publications. Uh, if you want to learn more about Martin Luther or really anything, uh, this is a fantastic little read. Um, so I really heavily encourage it. It's a, a very short introduction. I think it's easily rememberable. Um, but I just wanted to go over, over Martin Luther's life, and maybe there'll be something that you haven't heard before. Um, but Martin Luther never really actually wanted to be a priest. He, uh, he was a minor son. Uh, he was a blue-collar, blue-collar guy, um, and he was going to go and be a lawyer because lawyers make money, pastors don't. Um, so that's what he was going to do, and his father wanted him to do that. Uh, but he was stuck in this really bad storm, uh, and he thought he was going to die. Probably not, but, you know, it was the medieval periods, and lightning was scary. So uh, he, he prayed to God and said, you know, if you, if you keep me alive from this, I will devote my life to you. And he lived, and he decided, you know what, Dad? I'm not going to be a lawyer. I'm going to be a priest, and you're going to pay for it, because that's how it worked. So uh, reluctantly, uh, Hans Luther... Martin Luther's dad paid for his schooling, and Luther was quite the academic. He would have made a fantastic lawyer, uh, but he went into the priesthood. He was bound by his conscience every single day. He thought that he was the worst sinner that could have possibly walked this earth, and he hit himself. He abused himself. He prayed to God to forgive him of his sins. He thought he was worse than the cockroaches uh, that were in his cell. And no matter how much he prayed, he just could not stop sinning. He just couldn't understand why prayer didn't stop him from sinning. sinning. And the, the theology at the time of the Catholic Church was that, you know, if you did the work and you prayed to God and you paid for indulgences, that you would eventually, you know, be this wonderful person. And Martin Luther kept asking, why am I such a horrible person still? And then he found a loophole in the scriptures. What is that? Saved by grace through faith. And what book of the Bible is that in? Romans. And who wrote Romans? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really feeling the interaction, and I really feel like you love this sermon. <laughs> but saved by grace through faith. There was, there's still a heavy emphasis in Catholicism about works righteousness. I think it is a little less now than it was in the medieval period, but there was this idea that you had to work your way into heaven. Faith without works is dead. Even Martin Luther believed that. Um, but if you weren't doing any works and if you weren't improving, then you weren't being saved. That's what Martin Luther previously believed. But his radical change was this understanding that God loves us first. We don't earn God's love. We accept God's love. 
And when we do that, that means that no matter what we do, no matter how horrible of a person we are, if we accept God's love, we are saved. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't punishment. That doesn't mean that there, you know, there aren't consequences to our actions. But it doesn't mean that we're going to be damned to hell for all of eternity, which Luther was so fearful of. And he tried so hard to be a better person, but just seem, seemingly couldn't. So because of this, he wrote 95 theses. Those 95 theses included that theological revelation, as well as all the things that he thought that the Catholic Church was doing wrong. He did not want this to be a political uh, European-wide uh, movement. He thought that he was just going to post this and it would be a nice little, you know, theological and philosophical debate among scholars. Well, those people loved his 95 Theses so much because they too were kind of fed up with the Catholic Church's corruption. So they mailed it to the Pope. <laughs> Martin Luther didn't mail it to the Pope. The people who liked it did. Well, seemingly the Pope didn't like that. Uh, so what happened is that Luther was brought to the Diet of Worms, or Worms if you're German. Uh, so what did what happened at the Diet of Worms? Does everybody remember? The Pope was like, recant of your sins and your theological incorrectness, or you will be burned at the stake. And Luther was like, I cannot, for I have found the light. And they were like, okay, burned at the stake it is. So what happened is, is that Luther quickly got out of there, and some of the royalty of the time were like, we like this Luther guy because we hate paying money to the, to the Vatican. So if we can get this Luther guy to kind of be on our side, and there's a huge following, then maybe we could kind of get away from the Catholic Church and keep our money. So what happened was is that they kept Luther from, uh, from dying, from being murdered by the Vatican. So uh, he held out in that little castle of his that the, that the royalty so finally gave him. And then uh, what did he do while he was there? Trans he translated the Bible. Because what else do you do when you're in hiding? Uh, so that was the very first Bible that commoners could read. The very first. Everyone else had to be ed highly educated in order to read Latin. And uh, Luther thought, <laughs> Luther thought that if you read the Bible, if, if commoners just read the Bible, not priests, not popes or bishops, that if they read the Bible, they would come to the same conclusions that he did. <laughs> they did not. They did not. Um, and what happened was, is there were a lot of other reformers then at that point because so many other people were now able to read this Bible. So now you got Calvinists, Zwinglians, Anabaptists. You have all of these different kind of understandings of what the Bible is, because the people could actually think for themselves, thanks to Martin Luther. Martin Luther never wanted to leave the Catholic Church. He wanted to reform it. But unfortunately, because of all of this radicalization, because of what Luther had done um, in splitting the churches and coming up with all of these different kinds of interpretations of the Bible, the Catholic Church was not going to let him stay. Uh, so he then proceeded to write a bunch of letters, kind of blasting at the Pope, and, you know, hate and um, conflict sell. So his pamphlets were coming off the shelves, and he became a, a celebrity. Um, so he was kind of a little untouchable at the moment. And then at that time, he was able, because of his fame and fortune now with these, with these royalty and the people, he was able to kind of take people away from the Catholic Church. So nuns who no longer wanted to be nuns, um, priests who wanted to marry those nuns. Um, <laughs> true story. He was a matchmaker, Martin Luther, actually. <laughs> uh, and in that, Katie Luther wanted to marry Martin Luther. Uh, she actually wanted him and he didn't want her. Um, but after much convincing, they finally married, reluctant of Martin Luther. Um, but they were then married until his death. And then unfortunately, because of Martin Luther's kind of quirkiness, 
Um, he ended up getting a, a disease, probably um, something, probably people think maybe dementia, maybe Alzheimer's. Um, syphilis was rampant back then, so it might've been that. Um, but he became very, very anti-Semitic. Um, and that is one of our, part of our history that we unfortunately have to own. Um, so he, he thought that if he made the Bible clear as day, that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, that the, that the Jews would convert to Christianity. And when they didn't, he went on a rampage saying on how horrible and how they almost to the point of saying that they should all die. Um, he, was, he was proclaiming a mass extinction of Jewish people. Um, so that is some part of our history that we need to own. The ELCA has uh, set out a, a, you know, we're sorry for, for this guy, um, to the Jewish people. Um, but I think that we need to be very careful as Lutherans on how we uh, talk about Jews and Judaism um, and to, to not fall into the same traps that Martin Luther did. Um, I don't want to excuse uh, him because of his, his mental illness due to disease, but... Um, that did play a part in it. Um, and then Martin Luther did, did end up dying uh, in, in his 50s. Uh, and then we get the uh, Book of Concord, or the Augsburg Confession, which is what we still use to this day to ordain pastors um, into, into ordained ministry. So what I am bound to, what I agreed to follow in my ordination vows is what um, Philip Melanchthon, uh, which was Martin Luther's predecessor, and the other reformers created uh, to call Lutherans. So Luther did not actually see Lutheranism. Uh, that was Philip Melanchthon who created Lutheranism. Uh, but that is how we are much more Philip Melanchthons than are Martin Lutherans. Um, but that is kind of a brief history. I also wanted to point out and this is getting a little long, but I wanted to point out one of the most important things to Martin Luther was his spirituality. And I want to give, I'm going to give you a, a tool in reading your own Bible, um, because we are very lucky to be able to read the scriptures in our own language. Um, and I don't want us to take that for granted. So one of the most prominent spiritual disciplines was Lexio Divina. Has anyone ever heard of Lexio Divina? Lexio Divina. It's a divine reading. Lexio is, is Greek for reading. So in Lexio Divina, it's Lexio, Meditatio, Contemplatio, and Oratio. Reading, meditation, or thinking about the text in its simplest form, contemplation, and speaking. And this happens. This can happen in a group, which is supposed to, but it can also happen individually. And I want during Lent to kind of enter into this practice of reading your scripture in the Lexio Divina format. Um, and you should read it every four times. So you read it once, Lexio, read. Meditatio, read it, and then meditate on it. Think about the text. What is it saying? Contemplatio, read the scripture again. How does that scripture make you feel? Be with the text. Just kind of sit with it. And then read it once more. And then speak about it if you're in a group. If you're in a group or write, write. What did the scripture say to me? I think it's important that we take um, personal ownership of study of scripture. Uh, and I think Lent is a great, great opportunity to do that. So I encourage you all to what Martin Luther did. Uh, which came, to, which helped him come to his realization of saved by grace through faith. So what kind of revelations can we have um, as individuals through Lexio Divina? So again, that's read, meditate, contemplate, and write or speak. So hopefully that wasn't too much, uh, but that's, a, that's our uh, little history lesson and encouragement into our Lenten spiritual practices.